What a privilege to end this year by opening our Bibles together. And today I invite you to turn to Psalm 90. Go to Psalm 90. As we enter into the last hours of this year of 2023, many people, and I suppose some of us, are thinking of resolutions for the coming year. A recent survey published by Forbes says that 48% of people say that improving fitness is their top priority for 2024. 38% want to improve their finances, 36% want to improve their mental health, and 34% want to lose some weight. <coughs> There's many, there are many resolutions for next year, but in the year 1722, America's greatest theologian, Jonathan Edwards, became a pastor in New York City at the age of 18. <coughs> and at that autumn, he began writing a list of 70 resolutions that he would review in a weekly basis on a weekly basis for the rest of his life. The first four resolutions on his list were about living for the glory of God. That whatever he would do would maximize God's glory through him. That would be his top priority. And the following three resolutions had to do with the use of his time. In the fifth resolution said, resolved never to lose one moment of time. Sixth, resolved to live with all my might while I, while I do live. Seventh, resolved never to do anything which I were afraid to do if it was the last hour of my life. Jonathan Edwards understood that God had allotted him a certain amount of time, that his time on earth was limited, that it was a gift from God, and he wanted to use it wisely and effectively every minute, uh, for every minute of his life, living every present moment with an eternal perspective. He said, O oh God, stamp eternity on my eyeballs. That is the spirit of Psalm 90. Psalm 90 is the oldest of all the Psalms and the only Psalm written by Moses. Moses, the deliverer of the children of Israel, is lead leading them from Egypt to the Promised Land, a journey that, because of the rebellion, has taken 40 years. And towards the end of that long time, Moses is inspired to write this song that reflects on the fragility of man compared to the eternality of God and ends by praying and pleading that God that God's people would resolve to not lose one moment of time and this is what we will look at today as we finish as we bring this year to an end, to a close but before we start let's pray dear father thank you for your word and thank you for this prayer that moses prayed over three thousand years ago it is still relevant today and for us please let the spirit of this psalm uh, bring us a, a, a give us a eternal perspective um, and that this that is the the message we can take out from it thank you for all that you have done all and for all the time that you have given us and for all the time you will give us
I pray that the spirits of the Psalm may be with us. In Jesus' name, Amen. And the title of this message is Number Your Days. And we will start by reading Psalm 90 in its entirety. A prayer of Moses, the man of God. Lord, you have been at our dwelling place from generation to generation. <coughs> Be <coughs> Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn back, you turn man back to the dust, and say, Return, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday when it passes uh, by, or as a watch in the night. You have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning, they are like grass which sprouts in you. In the morning it blossoms and sprouts anew, toward evening it withers away and dries up. For we have been consumed by your anger, and by your wrath we have been dismayed. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. For all our days have declined in your fury. We have finished our years like a sigh. As for the days of our life, they contain seventy years, or if you to might, eighty years. Yet their pride is but labor and wickedness. For as soon as it is gone and we, we fly away, who knows the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? So teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. Return, O Yahweh, how long will it be? And be sorry for your slaves. O satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us, and the years we have seen evil. Let your work appear to your slaves and your majesty to their sons. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and establish for us the work of our hands. Establish the work of our hands. We will study this psalm under four headings that correspond to its four poetic units. Number one, we will look at the eternality of God, and then we will look at the frailty of man, and then the sinfulness of man, and then the goodness of God. We will start with the eternality of God. Uh, psalm 90 begins with a heading that attributes this psalm to Moses and it says a prayer of Moses the man of God it starts with this heading but it's specifically but specifically saying it is a prayer we will there are other prayers that and there are other psalms that that start by saying that they are songs but this psalm is specifically called a prayer. So we will see that from verses 1 to verse 11, there are Moses' meditations that lead him into his requests to God from verse 12 to the end. Not only the heading gives us the authorship, but it adds the badge of honor to his name, the man of God. And this is describing Moses' close relationship with God and the fact that his life belonged to God. And so Moses starts in Psalm, uh, in, uh, in the verse 1, Lord, you have been our dwelling place from generation to generation. Moses starts by reflecting on how God has always been there, dwelling place uh, through generations. But he, he, uses, he uses the word Adonai for Lord, recognizing God's sovereignty, his unlimited power, his never-ending reign, his throne above absolutely everything without boundaries or time limits. <coughs> uh, 
But then Moses affirms that he has been a dwelling place, referring to a habitation, a place where his people dwell, a refuge we can go to and be safe, sheltered, protected, preserved and cherished. Notice the wonderful contrast in this idea. The Lord that rules over human history is not a uh, ruthless tyrant and uh, he's not a, dis a distant king or an unapproachable politician, but he's a dwelling place where you can find refuge. Yeah, it says that he is a dwelling place where we can find refuge. His arms are open. The, op the doors are open. He is a refuge. And the Lord is a refuge not only f uh, for that group of 600,000 men plus women and children. Uh, the And we can... Uh, estimate that there were two million people uh, that Moses led out from Egypt. He says that not only he is a ref refuge for them, but a refuge from generation to generation. That means the Lord was a refuge for your parents. He was a refuge for your grandparents. And as far back as you know your lineage, God has graciously been a shelter to all those that have placed their trust in Him and abandoned their sins. Today, 3,500 years after Moses wrote this psalm, we can think of all the generations that came before us and we affirm that He is our dwelling place and a refuge and that there is no other. How come? Why is He a eternal refuge? Beca because the Lord is God. In verse 2 it says, before the mountains were born, or you, you brought forth the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Before any of us was born, before Moses and Abraham were born, before the mountains were born, before the earth was born, before creation was created, from eternity past to eternity future, you are God, Moses says. Moses worships. Moses is worshiping and, pray and uh, celebrating the fact that the Lord is God. If we recognize that the Lord is God, it means nothing happens by chance, nothing happens outside of God's will, nothing takes him by surprise. There is no sweat on his brow. He is God. That means that in the year 2020, he was God, and then in 2024, he was, he will be God. Even in hard times, even through the centuries of slavery for Israel in Egypt, and even in the end of those four decades in the wilderness, the Lord is accomplishing his will. He is God. May that be present. May we have this present and fresh in our minds all throughout the new year. That the Lord, that the Lord is God. Number two, the frailty of man. After reviewing uh, uh, the the ever present, never changing character of God, his eyes, uh, Moses's eyes, look horizontally to ponder the frailty, the fragility of human life. Look at verse 3. You turn back into dust and say, Return, O sons of men. Moses has seen many people die during the 40 years in the wilderness. 
we can estimate an average of 50 to 75 people died every day, <coughs> including, uh, including his dear Miriam and dear Aaron towards the end of that period. He was surrounded by death every day and uh, he knows that it is God who has allotted us time and that when that time is up God says return O sons of men and we return to dust our time is counted with precision when God says the time is up that means that well, we go back to dust God has set up a chronometer for each one of us. The clock is ticking, the sand in the hourglass is flowing, and we return to dust at the exact second our time is up, not one tick before and not one grain of sand afterwards. It is precise, it is counted. But with God, it is not so. Look at verse 4. For a thousand years in your sight are like yesterday, when it passes by, or as a watch in the night. Moses reflects on the fact that God is outside of time. For us it can be a thousand years, but that is nothing for the Lord. It is like if it had already happened. Uh, it's, to him it's like a watch of the night, which means a third part of the night. God is not affected by time, he is the creator of time. And his timing is the only one, the only one time that counts. His watch is the only one that reads the right time, always with precision and never late. He is the creator and the ruler of time. Verse 5 and 6. We have swept them away like a flood. They fall asleep. In the morning they are like grass, which sprouts anew. In the morning it blossoms and sprouts anew. Towards evening it withers away and dries up. In the poetic language of the Psalms, he hears a picture of the brevity of life. We are swept away like a flood. And that flood is time. We are... It's like water. It's like flowing water. It's like if our life is taken away by a... swept away by a wave. It's the flood of time that is taking away our life. We are like grass, Moses reflects. In that part of the world, the arid climate and night rain would cause a carpet of green grass to spring up in the morning, but then during the day, the blazing sunlight would scorch it, leaving the hills brown again by nightfall. Moses says that our lives are like that. It's like grass that is green in the morning, but then uh, gets scorched in the evening, by the, by the evening. The King David uses the same metaphor. In a Psalm uh, 103, verse 15, he writes, As for man, his days are like grass, as a flower of the field, so he flowers. When the wind has passed over it, it is no more, and its place acknowledges it no longer. James in his epistle writes um, in uh, James 4 uh, verse 14 you're a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away that is the reality the brevity of human life <coughs> how many times we have been surprised by how quickly the day went by and, and the week went by and the month went by, as time passes over us like wind, and suddenly we realize it is December. And we enter a new year, and we blink, and it is April. 
and time blows in October is here, in January, etc. That's how life passes by. Moses affirms it. Our time is brief and limited. Time is brief. Charles Spurgeon said, Here is the history of the grass. Sown, grown, blown, mown, and then gone. And the history of man is not much more. How great a change and how short a time. The morning saw the blooming and the evening sees the withering. Number three, the sinfulness of man. Not only Moses sets the grandeur and eternity of God against man's limited time in this fragile life, but also recognizes that death is a product of God's wrath. Verse 7 begins with, uh, with a 4 explaining well it's a uh, explaining and giving the reason for why our lives are brief okay uh, look at psalm 90 verse 7 for you have been consumed by your anger and by your wrath we have been dismayed you have set our iniquities before you our secret sins in the light of your presence Moses writes in the context of a whole generation of Israelites that was <coughs> dying by the day because none of them would be allowed to enter the promised land uh, according to Numbers 14. Not even Moses, the man of God, to whom God spoke as a man, speaks to a friend. Not even he himself would enter the promised land because of his sin. But remember that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. As God revealed to him everything that took place from creation through the years, no doubt he thinks of the fall of the human race. Or he thinks about Noah's flood, <coughs> the Tower of Babel, Sodom, and many other moments when God has directly and furiously poured his wrath against sin. We can see the judgment that falls suddenly on, on sin, on sinners. At the same time, God has declared the death sentence upon all humanity as a direct consequence of our sinful nature from Adam. We all die because we have all sinned. Paul calls it our wages. Death is God's payment in exchange for our sins. However, God's wrath will be fully manifested when on Judgment Day he gives justice to unrepentant sinners. God will judge every person by his standard of holiness. And if we are not morally perfect, then we will face his eternal wrath in hell. It is not only what we have actually done, with, but verse 8 tells us that our secret sins are in his presence. <coughs> the Hebrew literally tells us before your face so they are in the light of his presence those things you've done uh, we've done in darkness they are bright as day in front before his face all those thoughts that you thought were private those words that you never pronounced <coughs> Those imaginations that you never accomplished, they are as plain as day before the face of a holy God. That is exactly why you need a savior. Someone that could take away your sin and give you a clean slate, a new beginning and a new heart. 
tache blanche, quelqu'un qui puisse vous donner un nouveau départ, un nouveau cœur. That is why we need Jesus Christ, because He took away our sins. He took on the cross the eternal wrath of God, and in exchange He gives you a clean life, a new heart, and promises you that even if you die, you will live forever in paradise. That's what Jesus has done for us, and in response we must repent, turn from our sins, and believe in Jesus as our Lord and Savior. He died for our sins and rose from the dead, promising, <coughs> uh, uh, promising that we will be forgiven of any sin in thought, word, and deed. But we must repent, and we must put our trust in Jesus alone. Look at verse 9. Moses says, For all our days, having declined in your fury, we have finished our years like a sigh. Uh, he literally writes that our days have declined. <coughs> he recognizes that uh, he and the children of Israel started so well. They saw God's hand powerfully delivering them from Egypt. And in Exodus 15, Moses and all Israel sang to the Lord, and they danced and celebrated and praised God. They swore allegiance and obedience. They laughed and rejoiced because they had been delivered. <coughs> After 430 years of slavery, they were free. God was faithful. But almost immediately, the people began to complain because they didn't have water, then because they didn't have food. And complaints and conflicts continued, and they ended up worshipping a golden calf. And everything went downhill very quickly. And their years declined. So Moses looks back and regretfully says, Our days have declined, and now our lives end with a sigh. Not only they are short compared to the lifespan in Genesis, but our short lives are wasted. Sigh. A, our, our lives end with a with a with a sigh with a sigh of, regre of regrets <coughs> the regrets of a life that was short but it declined our, our, our lives aren't as long as those of uh, that were before us but our short lives, our already short lives, can decline. Friends, we must live in such a way that time doesn't end our life with a sigh. Look at verse 10. As for the days of our life, they contain 70 years, or if due to might, 80 years. Yet their pride is but labor and wickedness, for soon it is gone and we fly away. Moses considers a normal lifespan. He himself lived 120 years, but even that is nothing compared to the eternality of God. Methuselah, for example, lived 969 years in the book of Genesis. But again, that is but one millimeter in the kilometer of eternity. And Moses says, no matter how strong we are today, how successful or full of life we are today, uh, we might, uh, if we are in the prime of life, the most prideful period in life, it is nothing but labor and wickedness. Refer referring to inconveniences and afflictions. 
there are problems, there are trials. In other words, not only life is brief, but even in our best moments, there are hurdles to jump over, daily difficulties, and trials that make life hard. There are daily problems, and suddenly, time has passed, and time blows by as a wind, and time makes you fly away into eternity. That's the end. These are not morbid thoughts, but they are realistic thoughts. They are not negative thoughts. Life is brief and it is difficult. And it is our own mortality that will make us define our priorities. It is the realization of our condition with respect to time that will make us calculate those factors into the equation of life in order to may actually live and live with purpose. If we do that, then we will actually, we will really live with purpose. Moses ends with his reflection in verse 11 with a rhetorical question. He asks in verse 11, who knows the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you? That is his conclusion. He asks, who understands uh, rightly God's anger against sin and life and eternity? Who understands that we are mortal and that life is short? That we do not have, we cannot buy time? Who can truly grasp the reality of the frailty of life? Who is truly living? Who is truly living in light of eternity? And who walks in a healthy fear of the Lord? The implied answer is no one. No one can live like that. No one can understand all those things. So, in the light of all these reflections, in the light of the eternality of God, the mortality of man, the consequences of sin, and our inability to grasp all these, in the light of all that, uh, in light of all those things that, that Moses said, Lord, I have a prayer request. I have something to ask you. Verse 12. So teach us to number our days. That is Moses' request. Teach us to number our days that we may present to you a heart of wisdom. This is the heart of the psalm. <coughs> this is Moses' request. This is what our hearts should pray every morning because we know that we have limited time, that God would teach us to number our days. Oh God, please help me to live with eternity in view. I don't want to waste my life. I don't want to abuse the time you give me. <coughs> I need to I need your help to live without distractions. I need your assistance to do not squander any minutes. Please enlighten me to think rightly about the brevity of life. Please lead me to respond correctly to the time you've allotted me. Please teach me to number my days, to value, to know, to feel the weight of every minute and every hour of my life. Please help me to appreciate and to know and to feel the weight of every minute, of every hour of, of my life. The verb teach us carries that urgency. 
it is a plea. It literally means cause us to know to number our days. That may you, O Lord, please teach us to appreciate our time here on earth. Moses recognizes that without God's intervention, we will be absorbed by the many flashy things around us. We will be fascinated with life itself while time is slipping through our fingers. <coughs> Pursuing foolish things, squandering minutes in vain things, wasting our strength on completely irrelevant activities, neglecting what really matters. And we, we, Moses recognizes this and he invites us to pray for God's help. Pray for, for all this. It is part of our nature to live for the moment and take our days for granted instead of counting our days. And to <coughs> let the days flow by and to let life flow by instead of counting our days. That's why Moses gives a reason for his petition. He teaches us to value our days so that for the purpose that we present to you a heart of wisdom. Or better translated, that we offer to you a heart of wisdom. I want to live wisely, valuing my time, using it for your glory. And as you help me to do that, I present you my heart. I offer you my heart which has lived wisely with respect to time. Whether you are under the age of 20 or over the age of 80, ask God to teach you to number your days. Otherwise, in the end, you will present to God a heart of foolishness. At a heart that has wasted time, and you will sin, thinking your time is unlimited, you will live under under the discipline and chastisement of God, walking in circles for 40 years, wasting a lifetime like Israel. However, if you live every day with eternity stamped on your eyeballs, as Jonathan Edwards said, then you will live every moment for the glory of God. O oh Lord, teach us to number the next 365 days, every single one of them, and then the next one, and then the next one, and then the next one, until you call us home. Please help us to number our days, day by day. James Montgomery Boyce said, of all the mathematical disciplines, this is the hardest to number our days. We count everything else, but we do not seem able to use our days rightly and with wisdom. Number four, the goodness of God. The last unit of the psalm is the continuation of Moses' prayer. First, Moses asks for forgiveness. In uh, verse 13, he says, Return, O Yahweh, how long will it be? And be sorry for your slaves. Moses pleads with God for forgiveness, that God would return to them in his favor and unmerited love that God would look at them with compassion, be moved, be sorry for your people, forgive. 
Here Moses uses God's name, Yahweh, uh, the name which God had revealed to Moses uh, first decades before. Notice the reference to time here. It says, how long will it be? The plea is urgent. The time is limited here. So please forgive us now. Please forgive us and restore our, your favor to us today. For our time is limited. And you see how it requires humility to pray like this, to recognize that you are a God's slave at the end of verse 13. And that you need your master to act on your behalf and forgive you. That he gives you your hand, uh, his hand, that he offers you his help. Second, Moses asks for satisfaction. I was satis in verse 14, I will satisfy us in the morning with your loving kindness, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. The prayer is that every morning, as we open our eyes, it would be God's loving kindness, his, your satisfaction, our satisfaction, that we may, it may be his, his said in Hebrew, his perfect, unmerited, unlimited, sacrificial love, that their satisfaction would be found in knowing that God loves you like that. That he knows you. And that he gave his son on the cross for us. That's how we can know every morning that God loves us. Just look at the cross. That is how much God loves you and he loved you before you had done anything right or wrong. And he gave Jesus to die for you so that you live for him. We don't know what 2024 will bring. But we know what we can s that, but we know that we can sing for joy and be glad every single day of the new year because we are satisfied in knowing that the eternal God loves us, that he is our dwelling place and that we are forgiven in Christ. And that he is our refuge, that we are forgiven in him. There are 10,000 10, reasons, like, like we sang. Third, Moses prays for gladness. In verse 15, make us glad according to the days you have afflicted us and the years we have seen evil. For 40 years, they've been stuck in the mud, being chastised by God because of their rebellion. And so Moses prays, make us glad, let us be merry, let us rejoice. And he uses a reference to time once more. He says, cause us to rejoice, literally, he says. Cause us to rejoice for that same period of time in which we've been under your discipline. In other words, we have wasted time. We have lived for ourselves. We've been in the desert of selfishness. But in the time we have left, we want to be satisfied in your love. We need your help. You make us glad. Fourth, Moses pays f prays for testimony. In verse 16, let your work appear to your slaves and your majesty to their sons. The work of God refers to all of the things he has done. That all the works of God be visible or, uh, or present to them. But not only to them, but also to their sons. Those that would actually enter the promised land. That the works, the actions performed by God would be very present, but also that they will grasp what those works mean. That God is majestic. 
that he is glorious every work of God uh, is maybe uh, transferred to the next generations the, the glory of God and his works that's what the word means the word refers to his royal splendor his glory that we ourselves not only would have biblical doctrine before us but that as we teach it to the next generations we will help them to see the majesty of God his kingship, his royalty, his magnificence, his authority his ultimate power, his lofty position that is the spirit of Moses here he prays for that, for the next generation to finish, number five, uh, and finally fifth, Moses prays for favor. In verse 17, let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us, and, and establish for us the work of our hands, establish the work of our hands. In the end of his prayer, Moses calls God, Lord our God. He says Adonai Elohim, depending on the translation. You know, by, by saying that, he recognizes once again God's sovereignty, his ultimate rule as he did in verse 1 and 2. And he asks, how does that favor, how can that favor be manifested in our lives? By God blessing the work of our hands by establishing, making firm the work of our hands. May it be the, wor the, the favor of God that, that establishes our works. Friends, ask the Lord to confirm, to bless the work of your hands, that it will have an impact long after you are gone, that what you do be a blessing to those that come after you who might have wasted our time being distracted and ineffective but in this prayer by grace you can finish the race well maybe yes we might have wasted our time but by God's grace we can finish the race well Lord please bless the work of our hands We have work to do while we are still here. There is a divine purpose for each one of us that is beyond our stuff and bigger than our lives. And the request of Moses here is so intense that he re repeats it a second time at the end of the verse. He says, establish the work of our hands. Moses recognizes uh, uh, recognizes that there is work involved, that people must labor and sweat and be creative and work. Nevertheless, and their part will be blessed by God for it to endure. So please, please pray that God blesses the work of our hands. Voila, friends, you see how it has been really profitable for Moses to dwell in the unwelcome realities of time, death, and wrath, as he has been led to pray such a prayer. And for in the end, and there is an urgency because in the end he realizes that there is an urgency because the time is short we have less time today than when this day began so teach us to number our days that's where the new year can begin that's where the new year must begin may it be our resolution with Edwards 
end with Moses, our daily prayer. Lord, please help us. Please teach us to number our days. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you for the time that you have given us, that you already gave us. If we are at the end of this year, it is by your grace. It is because you have decided that there is still stuff for us to do here. Thank you for all the things you have entrusted us with. Please, uh, please help us to number our days that we may that we may make the most of every second on this earth by doing something with eternal consequences, with an eternal impact. Please bless our work, the work of our hands. Please establish the work of our hands. We depend upon you, and whatever happens, whatever happens this year, at the end, if at the end of the of the at the end of this year we are, may we be together with each other. We have you have given us time to use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, Amen.